welcome guys back to the constitutional podcast so this is episode two of part two so you can go back to the previous episode where we gave an introduction to part two of course we are talking about the nigerian regional traditional legal framework before the advent of colonialism in the previous episode we introduced the background we also spoke brief, briefly on the history of nigeria and its constitutional relations and we finally made mention of the yoruba people clearly and elaborately explained by our amiable co-host blessings udo and she's with us in the studio today so blessings you can say hi then i can go ahead hello everyone welcome Welcome, welcome. Fantastic, fantastic. So that's the voice of blessings in the studio today. So as we forge on this episode, I will be going on to speak on the Hausa Fulani Kingdom and the Borono Empire. Now, in the north, city-states were created by the Hausa Fulani Kingdom and the Borono Empire. The Hausa people are the most populous, you will agree with me, by their statistical population, by the National Bureau of Statistics and MPC, Nigerian Population Commission, you know that the Hausa people are the most populous people in this country as we are today, occupying the greater part of the Northern Nigerian territory in landmass and in population. I mean, we give it to them, we throw cap for them. So those are the Hausa people. They are in the far north of the country, if you look at the map. Now, prior to colonialism, they were made up of two major groups of seven states each. Two major groups of seven states each. Now, the first group of states included the Buram, Darua, Castina, Zaria, Kanu, Ranu, Gobir, while the second group included Kebi, Zamfara, Nupe, Kurai, Yari, Lorraine, and Kwarafa. <laughs> My God. You wish you clap for me. I'm not Hausa, but I'm trying. <laughs> this pronunciation is not here. <laughs> so we're moving forward now. So these were the two major groups with the seven states each. Now, the historical development of this kingdom was governed by political and religious themes up to the beginning of the 19th century. So let's not forget our main aim of this podcast. So our main aim of this podcast is to bring to you understanding how the constitution of Nigeria came about from the antecedents, from the basics. What brought us from point A to where we are now? Now, we've discussed Yoruba, and this is Hausa. Under the legendary queen Amina during the 15th century, Zazau, the first Hausa empire, was established. In effect, Zazau, Zazau's dominion, rather, is said to have extended over territories as far as Benue and the Niger, and in some form over Bauchi, Kano, and Darwa. Now, Amina's epoch was succeeded by the imposition of Borono overlords on the Hausa states. The kingdom's political structure, when we say the kingdom, we're talking about the Hausa kingdom now. So the Hausa kingdom's political structure was largely credited to the jihad of um, Uthman Danfodio, fought in 1804. Of course, some of us are popular with the war per se, as you we can put that in exclamation marks. The jihad um, war of Uthman Danfodio fought in 1804, assumed control of the Hausa political system and founded the Sogoto Caliphate, an exceptional centralized political system of government. So the Hausa slash Fulani system of government was deeply and rudely centralized. Now, Uthman Danfodio diverse the new system for choosing and installing the emirs who would rule the caliphates. Remember, we spoke about the, the Sokoto Caliphate as it had a centralized political system. Now, an allegiance was owned by each emir to Danfodio. Let's go back a little. We said that Danfodio 
diverse the new system of choosing and installing the emirs who wrote the caliphate now allegiance by these caliphates were owned to Danfodio. so these guys were loyal to Danfodio and his two agents in Gowandu and Sokoto. Furthermore, Islamic law was adopted as the guiding principle of the administration. So let's not forget that uh, Muslim and Islam, they go hand in hand, or let's say the Hausas and Islamic law, they go hand in hand. The caliphate was split into the emirates, which each of which was ruled by an emir. And remember, this emir owed allegiance to Dafodi. Now, he was in charge of establishing laws. When we mean he, we're talking about the emirs. So now these emirs who owned allegiance to Danfudio were in charge of establishing laws. So now this is the point we want to make in the Hausa slash Fulani uh, empire. These emirs were in charge of making and upholding these laws. In other words, before the advent of colonialism in Nigeria before 1884, the Emirs and the Hausa and Borno Empire were in charge of making laws for the Hausa uh, people. And the Caliphate, of course, we say, it was split into the Emirates, which was, which was ruled by an Emir. We've made this point before, so we just want to iterate and make sure like you've understood this over and over again just for the knowledge based. Now, he was in charge of establishing laws, upholding them, and preserving tranquility over his emirates. He would be responsible for ruling the emirates in accordance with Islamic and Sharia law. Now, remember, we've said that uh, the Hausa and Borno Empire go hand in hand with Muslim, with Islamic and Sharia laws. It was like the, it's like the, let me say, the we using the Holy Quran to rule the Hausa slash Borno Empire. That is what it was like practically before the advent of colonialism. And we still agree with me that even up to date, it's still being practiced. So it's not as if it's an old age uh, rule or law that doesn't exist again. It still exists up to now. Now the Emir is the head of the Emirates vested with the legislative, executive and judicial power. He is the supreme decision maker. Of course, remember, he's loyal to Danfudu making commands with which must be in line with the tenets of Islamic uh, law, which is also called the Sharia law. Now, the Emir heads both the spiritual and religious affairs of the kingdom, ensuring that the provisions of Sharia are adequately followed without reservations. The Emir's court was the highest and final, having the right to levy taxes on the Hausa slash Bruno uh, people and the, the Hausa, um, empire and it's um, what we call it now and the subjects underneath them. Now in addition the Emir had an advisory council who assisted in the daily administration of the Emirates. Now members of this council were regarded as the ministers assigned to various offices for administrative purposes. So uh, of course we want you to know that the Emirs here during the Hausa Kingdom and the Borono Empire. Um, they were in charge of the legislative, executive, and judicial powers. Hence, they made laws on behalf of the Hausa slash Fulani Kingdom and the Borono Empire. Now, we move on to the Eastern Igbo people and my Emir co host, Blessings, who will take over from here. Blessings, over to you. Thank you very much, Toby, for such an elaborate explanation or description of the Hausa Fulani Kingdom. Okay, um, I will be discussing the Eastern Igbo Kingdom, which, unlike their northern counterparts, had a more decentralized political structure. I, I normally describe the Igbo Kingdom as the pre colonial democratic states, truly democratic states, because the power sharing exercise among the Igbos were, was truly decentralized and there was a feeling of direct participation by every, from every family in those uh, villages. So um, we had elderly councils who were put in place instead of kings 
or emir, emirs that were uh, more prevalent in the north. There were, it was a broken down, a power broken down system. So the power sharing exercise included participation from Azor title holders, your four title holders and age grades, which gives a lot of credence to why the Igbo society, the prehistoric, uh, pre-colonial, sorry, Igbo society was described as a cephalus or an egalitarian society. This was based on a significant principle which they believed in as Igbo Enweze, which translates to Igbos do not have kings. Now, the Igbo political system did not have a strong centralized um, or centralization of power and authority. However, though, because there was a greater emphasis on direct citizen participation. So in the Igbo society, each family was expected to produce a representative who would assist in the governance of the whole society. Now, there was the village administration. Here, the village served as the basic unit of government in the Igbo political system. Each village was regarded as a community of related families, which was unified by a common factor, which was the land beneath them. So, the Council of Elders was made up of all the family heads who collectively held the titles of Ofo. So once you are a member of the Council of Elders, you are given a title called an Ofo title. Now, this brings, this best you with legislative, executive, and judicial power. So the Council of Elders were well met these three main powers of governance, the legislative power, they had the they had the power to make laws, the executive power. They had the power to implement these laws made by them, and of course, the judicial power, where they tried people who who were believed to have erred the laws that were made or the laws of the land. Now, the council was constituted by each family that lived in that territory. So, each family that lived within a particular territory, let me say, a village was expected to bring a representative, which is, regard, which is usually the family head of that family. Now, all the family heads in that uh, village would then form the Council of Elders. The village was governed by the council, and every adult is required to attend the village meetings. Of course, if we remember our while growing up, African magic, where we had um, the when we would have things like there is a in, everyone is meeting in the village square, you see a lot of people coming to come and maybe they are trying matters, but of course those background Hollywood songs and all that was more like a village meeting. It gives you a pictorial representation of how those societies had their village meetings, where every adult is expected to be in those meetings. This is not just for the council. Every adult within that village is expected to be in their village meetings. So it gives you a feel or an insight as to how this society, the, the Eastern Igbo um, society was being governed and administered. So each member of this council was named of four title holders, as I said earlier. And one of the of four title holder was acknowledged as being the most senior amongst all of them. So of course, there would always be one of the family heads in that uh, village that is the most senior. And he's regarded as being the wisest and um, I would say most respected, but he's he's given credence wisest in the sense that he has more knowledge as to the history of that particular community. However, he is not treated as a king. He does not have the power to make sole decisions without the voices of all other representatives of families in that village. He's just, okay, we, we, we believe you have more um, experience or you might have more knowledge as regards our history but that is also it he's not given any priority above other family representatives now the villagers were in charge of enacting laws so um, the villagers they said that okay we have representatives so you could you, you imagine being in such a society you would literally have your father say oh i'm going to, you could have your father say i'm going for 
uh, the council of elders meeting, he's representing your family. So each uh, the villagers were in charge of enacting laws. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a particular group called the age grade. Now, the age grade was made up of young men who belonged to the same group, um, age group and carried out duties related to the day-to-day -day running of the Igbo society. Um, you would have these people, maybe this group, sorry, making uh, roads, maybe they're helping clearing a particular village project. They are this responsibility was actually placed with the age grade. Maybe you could see for some of them between 20 to 30, 30 to 40, they usually fell among the same age grade and helped with the daily execution of tax within that society. Now, the Igbo society had four levels in the Igbo political system. These levels include the family, of course, the basic units of every society with the father as the head of that uh, unit. The family group was headed by the Okwara, who controlled the family and resolved disputes within the family. So, uh, for instance, I would say the family, this is, is like the extended family in our, in our present day. So we have different nuclear families that make up the extended family. So... Each family head is like the head of the nuclear families. But amongst those families, the nucle among the nuclear families, we had the most senior family head who is regarded as the acquirer within that extended family. And he was responsible for resolving disputes within the extended family. Now, we also had um, another level of Another level we did the Igbo political system, which was the Kijred. The Kijred was a smaller social unit consisting of the head of the nuclear family. It's 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 somehow similar to uh, what I mentioned as regards the family. We have uh, brothers. You could have brothers. You could have cousins. They are nucle nuclear families. The cousins, all of them are regarded as. Um, they are regarded as members of the kindred. And the head of each of those nuclear families came together to form the kindred in a way. Then we have the village. This consisted of the kindred and clusters of kindred. So all these different kindred within that village came together to form the village. And the village was mo more of a geographical... They were... Uh, it was more of a geographical setting. All of them with all those different kindred within that particular community was referred to as a village. Now, we then have the town, which is the last level in the Igbo political system. It, was all, it is also the highest political unit made up of villages. The latter, the, the latter was consisting, while the village was consisting of like, collections of kindred with attachments to land as their common unifier. The town was made up of these villages. In just opposing it with our present, present day, the way we have local governments forming towns, we have villages within these towns. Then we still have kindred within these villages. Then we still have families within the kindred. That is, wow. it's still, it's, do you understand? That is like, it's a breakdown from town to uh, village to kindred to family, down to your own nuclear family. So that was how the Igbo uh, political system was basically born. And uh, it gave everyone a, a sense of belonging, in the sense that everyone believed they had a representative. They had someone who was making, who was taking part in decision-making in that particular um, society. So yes, thank you very wow, much. Wow, 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 wow! Blessings, blessings. It's been, it's been an informative, it's been an informative session from the introduction to the history to the Yoruba to the Hausa and the Borno Empire to the Igbo Empire. I mean, I'm sure our listeners must have taken out uh, a lot of information uh, unexpected. However, I'll uh, just a general conclusion. So um, some of us may be, or rather will be familiar with the Berlin uh, Conference, which divides Africa amongst European power lines that resulted in the British colonization of Nigeria in 1884. 
Now, Britain established the Protectorate of Nigeria in 1914 and took control of both the north and the south of Nigeria as one colony with Lagos as a separate colony. So this is just a general history of uh, how Nigeria came about aside the constitutional development. So in our next uh, constitutional episode, we will be looking at the pre-colonial constitutional history and the pre uh, we'll be looking at the 1960 independent constitution, 1963, the 1979, and the 1999 Third Republic Constitution. So I really hope that you tune into the next constitutional uh, episode. And uh, of course, tell a friend to tell a friend to get informed. Today's uh, episode was uh, hosted, of course, by an eruption. Don't forget to, as we always say, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend and like listen to the constitutional podcast, uh, leave a message for us if you have any suggestions on the way we can improve, you know, and never above mistakes or errors and let us know that. So we have done part two and part two consists of two episodes. If you haven't listened to our previous podcast recording, we employ you to go back and, you know, take a quick listen. It's under 30 minutes, just informative and under 30 minutes. It's nothing too much for you to do so. Stay tuned for our next recording and we hope to blow your minds as always. I am Toby Oraka and with me always is Blessings Udo. Blessings Udo. That's my main guy, guys. So uh, have a lovely day, guys. Uh, see you soon. Bye.